Hello and welcome back. In this Black Excellence presentation, we will highlight Fred Hampton, the charismatic chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Welcome to BlackExcellence.com, the site where we share Black excellence, opulence, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. Frederick Allen Hampton was an American civil rights leader and deputy chairman of the Black Panther Party's Illinois chapter who formed the city of Chicago's first rainbow coalition. However, Hampton was killed during an FBI raid on his residence by Chicago police officers. The new biopic, Judas and the Black Messiah, centers on the assassination of Fred Hampton. But here's what you should know about the charismatic Black Panther leader and his life. So without further ado, let's get started. Hampton was born the youngest child of Francis and Iberia Hampton in Argo, Illinois, a southwest Chicago suburb, on August 30th, 1948. Among his family's acquaintances and neighbor was Emmett Teal, the 14-year-old black teenager who was murdered in Mississippi while visiting relatives for allegedly whistling at a white woman. The Hampton family's connection with Till, along with their experience of racial inequity in their suburban community, made Fred keenly aware of racial injustice. While attending high school in Maywood, a southwest suburb, Hampton organized a student section of the NAACP, led a boycott of homecoming, forcing the school to allow black girls to compete for homecoming queen, and became head of the school's interracial council, which met when there was racial friction in school. As a teenager in high school, Hampton held several jobs and eventually earned enough to pay his college tuition. During those high school years, he pushed Maywood to fund a summer job program, and he also organized community members to integrate a local pool and recreational center. After graduating from high school with honors in 1966, Hampton enrolled in a pre-law program at Triton College, a public community college near Maywood. Hampton would continue his activism, marching several times with Martin Luther King Jr. when he came to Chicago to fight for equal treatment of black residents in housing, jobs, and schools. Many white people, some dressed as Nazis, came to spit and throw rocks at marchers during that time. He also experienced firsthand negative and violent interactions with the police at these rallies and demonstrations. Seeing the brutality directed towards the protesters left Hampton feeling disenchanted with the NAACP's and Dr. King's non-violent approach. He parted ways with the by-the-book NAACP and started leaning towards Malcolm X's message of self-defense. He took note of a growing movement of the newly formed Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. Led by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, the organization was originally intended to organize patrols of Black neighborhoods and protect residents from police brutality. It quickly evolved into a Marxist revolutionary group that called for arming African American communities, lobbying against military drafts for African Americans, and paying reparations for the Black community for the centuries of exploitation. In 1968, Bobby Rush, a U.S. representative and then Black Panther, received a mandate from the National Party to start a chapter in Chicago. Having met Hampton and heard him speak at marches and protests, Rush recruited him right away, and they opened the office together, making Hampton one of the founding members of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Hampton would eventually become chairman and Rush deputy minister. One of 45 chapters in the country, the Black Panther Party chapter of Illinois militantly stood against racism, capitalism, and police brutality. Hampton used his talent as a communicator to create what he termed a rainbow coalition, an alliance of the Panthers with other groups organized around racial, ethnic, and ideological affiliation, bringing together groups that otherwise would have had almost no positive contact, including the Puerto Rican Young Lords Association, the Poor White Young Patriots Organization, and the Black Stone Rangers Street Gang. The Rainbow Coalition provided aid to low-income citizens by combining the member group's varied resources. They also organized free breakfasts for the community and offered free legal consultations to help disadvantaged populations. The Panthers took a militant stance in the party's imagery, rhetoric, and sometimes action. 
This came at the expense of losing some support, especially among white people and some conservative-leaning black residents. The media constantly criticized and publicized incendiary stories about the Black Panthers, while law enforcement became more and more focused on monitoring the actions and whereabouts of the party members. In 1968, FBI leader J. Edgar Hoover declared the Black Panthers the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. He ordered agents to employ a range of tactics, many illegal, including mail openings, phone taps and bugs, burglaries, and paid informants to bring the Panthers down. The Bureau also used anonymous mailings sent to Panther headquarters to try and stir up trouble and paranoia among the party members. On November 9, 1969, Hampton became a target and possible suspect for what Hoover considered the threat of an emerging messiah, a leader who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Hampton would be the subject of the FBI's COINTELPRO program. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Stokely Carmichael, Elijah Muhammad, and Billie Holiday were all subjects of this same secretive operation intended by the FBI to discredit and neutralize organizations that the agency considered subversive. The FBI hired an African-American teenager to be their informant who would infiltrate the Black Panther organization. William O'Neill, a few months earlier, had stolen a car, driven it under the influence of alcohol, and crashed it. In exchange for dropping the resulting charges against him, O'Neill would provide the FBI with reports on Panther meetings, members' access to weapons, and the floor plans of their homes, with a special focus on Fred Hampton. And since O'Neill was appointed as the Illinois chapter's security director, he was in an ideal position to do so. The Panthers and the Chicago Police Department often clashed during Hampton's brief tenure, resulting in casualties on both sides. After a shootout between the Panthers and Chicago Police, which left two officers and one Panther dead, local law enforcement began to focus more intensely on Hampton and the Panthers. The Bureau then approached Chicago and state attorneys' police with information from their paid informant, and together they plotted to bring Hampton down. In addition to tipping off the FBI about Hampton's upcoming promotion to an office position at the national party level, O'Neill also provided the feds with a treasure trove of information about the layout of his apartment on the west side of Chicago. Provided with a floor plan, the Chicago police believed that the apartment, which often served as a de facto headquarters for the Panthers, would reveal a stockpile of drugs, weapons, and illegal firearms. At 5 a.m. on December 4, 1969, Chicago and state's attorney police raided the headquarters of the Black Panther Party. A 14-man team of police officers broke into the apartment and fatally shot Hampton as he slept in his bed. Mark Clark, a downstate party leader, was also murdered during the raid. Though weapons were seized from the apartment, they were never properly identified. The survivors of the raid, including Hampton's pregnant common-law wife, Deborah Johnson, were arrested for attempted murder, aggravated battery, and unlawful use of weapons. Later, it was revealed that of the nearly 100 shots fired during the raid, all except perhaps one were fired by the police. Following the shooting, state's attorney Edward V. Hanran held a press conference where he told Chicago Daily News reporters that a gun battle broke out as state's attorney's policemen tried to enter the apartment to search for illegal weapons. Hanran said the officers allegedly announced themselves only to be met with gunfire and that three times officers seized fire and demanded the occupants come out with their hands up. Police insisted that a gun was found next to Hampton's hand and that he had shot at them, pointing to a number of bullet holes in the wall. Close friend and congressman Bobby Rush proclaimed Hampton's innocence and even led reporters on a tour of the apartment, showing them bullet holes from police firing into the apartment, but no shots fired out. Days after the shooting, Chicago Sun-Times reporter Joe Riley received a tip that those were nail holes, not bullet holes. The news story started unraveling the narrative that police tried to spin. All the while, the FBI remained quiet about its role in Hampton and Clark's murder. It would be years before the truth of the Bureau's involvement would come out. Today, the search for the truth continues. 
Still an active member of the U.S. Congress, Representative Rush just introduced a bill that requires government agencies to disclose all files related to the FBI's now disbanded counterintelligence programs. The bill has no co-sponsor and is facing an uncertain fate. But Representative Rush, like many of us, believes that it is past time that our country fully knows and understands its dark past. And the release and study of this information is an important step on this journey. We appreciate the fact that you stayed with us until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss a video. Bye for now. We will see you tomorrow.